Everyone has a story. My story started back when uh, I was a child, I lived in a farm. And I'd go out to the barn, I'd see my mother, who I loved very much, lying in the manure in the gutter behind the cows, where my dad had yanked off the air hoses of the milk pipes and literally beat my mother to a bloody pulp until she was so weak and bloody she couldn't stand up. And at eight, nine, ten years old, I'd be beating my dad and kicking him, saying, when I'm strong enough, I'll kill you. And growing up, my father was a town drunk. I hardly ever knew him sober. Anyone who has an alcoholic parent carry shame with them every day of their life. And I'd go to school, and my friends would make jokes about my dad downtown in the gutter making a fool of himself. And you know, they didn't think it bothered me because I would laugh on the outside when I was crying on the inside. And every time they told a joke about my dad, it hurt, but I never, ever let anyone know. And so before friends would arrive, I'd go out to the bar and he'd either be passed out or halfway there. And I'd lift him and I'd pull him into the pen where the cows would have their calves. And I'd just drop him on the straw and then tell friends, of, well, he had to go away an important call just to keep from being shamed. And in case he woke up before he left, I'd go back out there. And it would take me a while, because I was just a little kid, but I'd get him up against the boards. And I'd put his arms to the board and tie a rope from one arm to the other arm. Then I'd take another rope and I would put it around his neck like a hangman's noose and put the other end behind him around his feet. As tight as I could pull that rope, I would pull it until his head would go completely over that top board. You know, the first time I did that, I left him there probably about six o'clock at night, went out about 5.30 the next morning, and I was so discouraged. I was so disappointed. He was still alive. All I ever wanted as a kid was for my dad to quit hurting my mother, and I couldn't stop him. When I was 11 years old, my oldest brother Wilmot, I was one of five kids, he was the oldest, I was the baby, took my parents to a court of law and sued them for everything they had. One of the things my brother got in the settlement was a new home my parents had built in the farm for workers. And he announced to my parents he was gonna move it downtown into Union City, Michigan. Well, come on, when they announced the day that they were gonna move that house, I could hardly sleep. I mean, my adrenaline was pumping everything. And Saturday morning came, got up extra early, did my chores, took a good shower, put on my best work clothes, ran out of the house, and as a little 11-year-old kid, I ran up that knoll, and I think sometimes my, my feet didn't even touch the ground. I was so excited, and I got to the top, and my world came crashing down. I heard these farmers, these merchants, these parents of my friends yelling the dirtiest, filthiest names at my parents. And I couldn't handle it. And I snapped. The only conscious thought I have, and whoa, is it conscious. I can remember running down the other side of that knoll in front of everyone as an 11-year-old kid crying and screaming. One of the most shameful things that could happen to an 11-year-old. And I ran to the end of the barn where there was a room, not very big, but it had three stalls or bins in it for wheat, oats, and shelled corn and to grind up for cattle feed. So I ran up the six steps, turned around, and slid that big door closed, put the iron latch down on it until it was absolutely pitch black. And then at 11 years old, I turned around and I climbed up into that shelled corn bin and I buried myself in that corn up to my neck. And that's when I prayed to die. I didn't want it anymore. I felt such shame. And I was there for three hours. And I still can't believe it. My parents never, ever came looking for me. You ever felt lonely? Ever felt abandoned? Ever felt like, you know, it wouldn't matter to anyone if I lived or died? That's exactly how I felt at 11 years old, and I just wanted to die. I uh, dug myself out of the corn, which took a while, and I jumped out of the bin. And I went over and took the big iron latch off the door. When I slid it open, that sunlight hit me in the face. It shocked me into reality. At that moment, I slammed the door on my father. I damned him and I cursed him. And I slammed the door on God and I damned him and I cursed him. 
for abandoning me in that corn bin. I slammed that door for about six, seven years. Two months before I graduated from high school, I came home on a Saturday night, probably about midnight from a date. And I walked into the farmhouse and I heard my mother crying. And it scared me. And I ran into her bedroom yelling, Mom, what's wrong, what's wrong? She sat up in bed and she said, Son, your father has broken my heart. Then she reached out, put her arms around me, pulled me to her. And, oh, I still remember what she said. She said, son, I've lost the will to live. All I want to do is live until you graduate, then I just want to die. Oh, that was hard to hear. And the irony is, two months later, actually 61 days later, I graduated from high school, and the next Friday the 13th, my mother just up and died. Don't tell me you can't die of a broken heart because my mother did my father broke it and I hated him for it. I enrolled in college and uh, after a couple weeks there, I saw a small group of people who seemed to have a, would you call it contentment or joy that wasn't dependent on outward circumstances. It was in spite of it and that kind of puzzled me. But probably the biggest thing I saw was here was a group of students and professors who seemed to have, appeared to have, a genuine love and concern for each other. Now you'll find that everywhere. But the difference that I saw was this. They also seemed to have that same love and concern for those outside their group. The way I was raised, that was weird. And I wanted it, so I made friends with them. And after several weeks, we're sitting around the table in the student union, and I really wanted what they had. But I didn't want them to know that I wanted what they had. So I leaned back in my chair and just kind of in a very hackneyed, flippant way, I said, hey, tell me, what changed your lives? I'm trying to act totally disinterested. Why are you so different than the other students? And this young lady looked at me with a little smile. And she just said two words, two words I never ever dreamed I'd hear in the context of the university on the solution. She just looked at me and said, Jesus Christ. I said, oh, for God's sakes, don't give me that garbage. I figured if you couldn't make it anywhere else in life, you'd become a Christian, kind of like a loser. And I lit into him. I said, I'm fed up with religion, the Bible, with Christianity, and the church, and Christians. I want nothing to do with it. Well, you know what? They held their space. They didn't back off. This young lady shot right back at me. She didn't smile this time. She said, Mister, I didn't tell you religion. I didn't tell you the church or the Bible or Christians or Christianity. I told you the person of Jesus Christ. I said, whoa. I apologized to him because my mother had not raised me to be rude and I'd really been rude. I mean, I nailed those Christians. And so I apologize, but then I attached a disclaimer to my apology. I said, I want you to understand something. Just because I've apologized, I still don't want anything to do with Christianity. When I walked out of that corn bin and stuffed that anger down into my life, when they mentioned Jesus Christ, all that anger came out. I was the problem. So they made me so mad. I said, okay, I'll refute you. And so, I set out, uh, left college, traveled throughout the United States, England, Germany, France, Switzerland, gathering the evidence, looking at the manuscripts, checking out people, interacting great thinkers who had either examined Christianity, rejected or examined Christianity and accepted it. And I'd returned to London, England. It was a Friday night, about 6.30. And I'll never forget, I leaned back in my chair and I cut my hands behind my head and right in front of everyone, I said, which was probably three people in that little uh, uh, museum library, I said, it's true, it's true, it's true. And what I concluded by that was that I could hold the New Testament in my hand and say what I have is what was written down. It has not been changed. And second, I concluded that what was written down was true, that Jesus said it and he had done it. And so that December the 19th, about 8.30 at night, got alone with a friend of mine. And I established a relationship with a God who became man, and his name was Jesus. 
and he was passionate about a relationship with me. I just said, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. The most humbling thought I've ever had when I realized if I were the only person alive, Jesus still would have died for me. I still get chills thinking of that. So I said, thank you. Second, I knew the Bible was true. And I knew the Bible said, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I said, right now, I confess my sins. I accept your forgiveness, not based on anything that I have done, but based upon what Jesus Christ did on the cross in dying for the sins of the world and my sins. I invite you into my life as my personal Savior and Lord. Nothing happened. No bolt of lightning. I didn't rush out by a harp. Well, something did happen. I kind of felt like I was going to vomit. I thought I was going to throw up. I hear all these Christians say how they came to Jesus and they're overwhelmed with joy. And I came to Jesus and I felt sick to my stomach. Immediately after I trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, invited Him into my life, I, th I thought this. It was kind of like I had a dialogue with myself. It went like this, Josh, have you made an emotional decision to trust Christ you are going to regret intellectually later? And you know, that scared me with the emphasis I put on truth and knowledge. But in about six months to a year and a year and a half, oh, my entire life was changed. Starting from the bottom up. And uh, one of the first things that happened I hated my dad. I despised him. I grew up believing he killed my mother and destroyed my family. I tried to kill him two or three times. And sometimes I put that rope around his neck in the barn. I'd pull it so tight, hoping he couldn't breathe. And I found myself, after I trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, I found myself looking my daddy right in the eyes and saying, Daddy, I love you. Whoa, you know that scared me. You say, what? Yeah. I did not want to love my father, even as a new Christian. I wanted that energy, that, that emotion that comes from hating someone. And there is an energy, it energizes you. And I wanted to hate the man who killed my mother and destroyed my family. And I found myself saying to the man I intellectually chose to hate, saying, I love you. That is when I knew it was real. I wasn't used to that. I was used to loving those I wanted to love and hating those I wanted to hate. I never had that capacity to love those I chose to hate. That's when I knew it was true. I transferred from Kellogg College to Wheaton College. I was in a very serious car accident in the hospital in intensive care for several weeks with severe injury to my neck and my lower back. So I was strapped in to this play. All I could do is move my eyes. I heard the ambulance leave and probably no more than five minutes, my father walked into that room. Every muscle in my body strengthened, tightened up, because a man I'd hated most of my life walked into that room and I couldn't do anything about it. He stood in the door, all I could do was kind of flash my eyes to see him. And I noticed two things. One, he was sober. I'd hardly ever seen my dad sober. Second, he was crying. The only emotion that I've ever seen in my father, and he's either mad at my oldest brother or my mother. He walks into my bedroom where I'm strapped in bed. He doesn't say anything, he just paces back and forth. And then he just stops about right here where I could just see him out of the corner of my eye. And you have to understand, he was just bawling. And he leans right over my face. And he looked at me and all he said was, Son, how can you love a father such as I? I said, Dad, six months ago I hated you. I despised everything that you stood for, what you did to mom and the family. But I said, Dad, I've come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And intellectually I've concluded that God became man and his name is Jesus. And he is passionate about a relationship with you. My dad stood up, turned around, and walked out. I was kind of thinking, 
well, I guess I really blew that one. And uh, in about maybe 45 minutes, I don't know for sure, he comes back in. And he walks right up to the bed, sits down on the edge of it, and leans over and it says, if God can do in my life what I've seen him do in yours and forgive me, then I want to know him personally. Oh, right there. My father prayed with me. You talk about joy. Most people don't have this much joy in a lifetime, and I had it in one moment. You know, my life was changed in six months, year, year and a half, and still areas being changed. Life of my daddy was changed right before my eyes. It was like somebody reached over and turned on a light bulb. He only touched alcohol once after that. Got to his lips, and he never touched it again. I mean, you know, he died 14 months later. But in that 14 month period, scores of people in that little tiny town going out about 100 miles committed their lives to Jesus Christ, over 100 people, because of the changed life of the town drunk, my daddy. So I guess I sum it up on my tombstone would be, and God became man, and his name is Jesus, and he is passionate about a relationship with every one of his creations. And he is passionate about a relationship with me.